Welcome to Leading Beyond Limits, the podcast where we explore the extraordinary journeys and insights of remarkable leaders who have pushed the boundaries of what's possible. Your host, Angel Radcliffe, who is a digital transformation leader, author, speaker, and financial educator, will lead each episode and dive deep into the stories, strategies, and philosophies that have empowered these exceptional individuals to lead, inspire, and achieve beyond the ordinary. We're about to embark on a journey of discovery and inspiration, and together, we'll learn what it takes to lead beyond limits. So grab your cape, or at least your favorite coffee mug, because we're about to unravel the extraordinary tales of trailblazers who've turned impossible into I'm possible. Let's get started. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thanks, Angel. I appreciate the time here. I'm looking forward to it. I am as well. I think this is going to be a great conversation and so many people will gain some insights on how to really deal with any conflict they have in their lives. So before we get started, I know this is going to be, who knows, this might be a heated conversation. We might have some conflict, (laughs) (laughs) but um, before we get started, I want my listeners to really understand who you are and what you do. Absolutely. So I am actually a technical geek by trade, computer science and math way back in undergraduate school, but I started evolving it in my career away from technology. And I was working a lot in the data and analytics space. And and that, those words kind of scare people, data. The the point there was I was using it to, to kind of make decisions and drive companies forward. And there's a lot of parallels between that and understanding the human element of decision making and that led me to learning more about organizational development and psychology which is like a a skill i think everyone needs to learn about to understand why and it just got me to a point now i'm a chief learning officer of a software company i've written a couple books around things like conflict and understanding the importance of diversity and inclusion as it relates to you know continuing companies and yourself moving forward innovating and keeping current. Well, that's awesome. And I always find it interesting how people are really building their brand and then you have your your full-time job as well. So how have you found that to be successful for you or building success yeah. in that nature? Luckily, there are some parallels where I'm able to, it's not too completely different thing. Oh, there's something to be said about if it's completely different, it's, you know, you can kind of stop your brain on one side and go to the other one. But there is a lot of overlap. So when we teach our employees and customers, we, you know, education, learning topics, how to upskill in today's workforce, professional development, a lot of it is is around understanding how to be a better you, understanding how to be a better employee, understanding how to be a better partner at home, a better father. And to me, I, I go, I always go back to the core element around both of these arms of me is is the human element, understanding people's beliefs, understanding their attitudes, understanding why we all have bias and how that can help us or hurt us in certain cases and help us if we're able to mitigate. So it it is two separate things, but they're kind of tied together at the core of, I I think it's helping me understand why people do what they do. And it's just two different outputs. One is in the corporate setting and one is more for like professional development of individuals. Such a broad array of topics there. And, you know, I can see within many of those topics and what you do in the corporate space where there can be some conflicts, especially when you're dealing with with different cultures and there's misunderstandings and some companies are not the best at really having these educational moments of understanding other cultures and how do we uh, respect other cultures. And I've been in some very toxic environments. So in my history of, of working and definitely seen some conflicts there. So I know that you have a lot of insight on, on the topic today, which is really dealing with conflict and, and why it's encouraged, especially in the workplace. So I, I want you to really give us your definition of conflict. Yeah, it's a it's a broad definition. I'll try to bring it back. But to me, conflict is when there's one, obviously it has to be more than one person, but there's multiple people that have a difference. And, and where I think it's important to clarify and dis, have distinction there, it, it could be due to their cultural differences, their beliefs, their backgrounds. 
but in terms of what they're actually having a conflict over, sometimes it's a process. Sometimes it's just requirements going forward. Sometimes it's neither. It's just like a perception. So to me, a conflict is anytime two people have a difference of opinion over things like processes or the way forward. And, and those differences or opinion are due to most often things that are like beliefs, cultural experiences, backgrounds, even two people coming from two different organizations that do the same thing are going to have different processes. The companies don't do everything in the same way. They get together on a project, they're working on something, they're going to have a conflict because someone's going to say, well, I do it this way. And someone else is going to say, I do it the other way. And we're not necessarily trained or we're not born with the skills to be like open and say, okay, let me hear your way. It, it, it's hard for us to do that. We have to practice it. Definitely. And during our conversation before the show, I mentioned some of my experiences around the topic. I facilitate a course managing conflict on teams for Cornell University's executive education. And one of the things that I find extremely interesting, every course, so I have facilitated 15 of these courses, thousands of students, and more than 90% of all of those students have said they tend to avoid conflict. One of the first discussion questions in the course is really, you know, how do you deal with, with conflict? Are you a smoother? Are you a withdrawer? And so many people will say, oh, I withdraw from conflict. I avoid it like the plague. And these are top executives. And I find it extremely interesting. I'm like, you get so far in your career that you don't know how to deal with a conflict, whether it's large or small. So leaning in on your experience and what you've seen do you think that's true in your work experiences that most people tend to avoid conflict? I Yes, I, but it, it's important to understand why. I think, and you said it, I think there are some people that just like to argue and, and like to have debates. And so there, you have to understand why someone's having a conflict. Many times my, my theory is that us as leaders don't have the right skills to combat that. It's not necessarily that we're overly empathetic. It's, it's not that we're like, okay, you know, I don't want to mentor someone. I don't want to give them my perspective. It's, I don't know how, or many times myself included when I was younger, we're like, I don't think well on my feet. I don't want to get into a conflict because I fear I'm going to lose. And then I'm in a culture, an organizational culture where, you know, that's going to put my job at risk. And so sometimes people without thinking their brain is weighing the pros and cons and they're just saying, yeah, you know, we should have this discussion, but I'm going to deal with it a year, two years, three down, years down the road when I don't, as opposed to immediate. And it's, it's because they don't have the skills and they're just putting it off and it's human nature. And so that's where I like to educate people in these types of courses and programs about what the right skills are to use, because then they're more confident doing it. And then it's better. I don't think people go into it saying, you know what, conflict isn't necessary. I think it comes out of lack of skills. What are some some ways that you have seen people avoid conflict? Someone passes in a work project to the lead, the, the manager of the team or or so forth, and they it, it's not good quality. It's missing something. I find a lot of times people can give constructive feedback, but they don't give the feedback where the, the taker, it's a complete miss of a process. Like you can say, okay, you did a great job here. The, you know, the feedback sandwich, you could improve on this area and then you did a great job here. If it's something that's going to be a quote unquote difficult conversation, I've seen it happen that way. And then the, the failure there is then the employee never learns that they did it wrong. They continue doing it that way and, and they're not improving. And us as leaders, that's one of our primary jobs is to grow our team and mentor and coach them. But I've also seen it in different situations where I mentioned I work for a software company from the, the data side. Many times there's conflict where people are, there's a problem. There's a decision to be made and people are in a room and they're discussing and they have differences of opinions. There's there's a type of bias called a group think where it says, okay, you have a difference of opinion, but your boss says one thing and maybe everyone else in the room says something else and you start having doubt. Well, maybe I'm wrong or I'm right, but you know what? I don't wanna rock the boat. I'm just gonna give in on this one. 
And there's been studies where those can be very small decisions, but those can be, you know, life or death, political decisions, economic decisions. And in that case, the conflict isn't the manager not wanting to tell the, you know, the individual contributor, you could have done this better or that better. It's you don't want to rock the boat. You don't want to come off as the attention on you as, okay, now I have to defend myself. It, it's again, both of those situations, those, those spectrums from one end to the other, a lot of times it comes down to the human component, the psyche, the brain, and not having the skills or the comfort level to do that. A big component we could talk about in organizations is when we do postmortems, a lot of times we'll hear, well, my culture doesn't support it. My organizational culture, not my personal culture, but we have a hierarchical command and control. I'm not supposed to challenge my boss. I'm supposed to just do this. And they fear if they start challenging things, then it's seen as a negative. So I, I think a lot of that can be done at the individual level by giving them a, a, a few new skills, but it can also be done by educating at the organization level that the organization needs to say, we embrace productive conflict, we embrace difficult conversations, and then practice what they preach and actually allow it to happen as opposed to you know, suppressing it, which I think happens from time to time. People say they wanna be open and inclusive and have a you know, productive conflict environment, but I'm not sure if all the leaders are on board on that yet. Those are great points, Kevin. And, you know, one of the things that I want to say there is I, I personally feel like conflict avoidance is people pleasing behavior. And I know, you know, being in, in the work environment or a professional environment, we don't want to step on someone's toes, especially if you're young and you're new. I remember coming out of college in my first job, like you never want to challenge anyone because you're like, wait, I need my job. And you're, you're always scared. You're going to get fired exactly. for something. <laughs> And so you're like, wait, I, I don't, you don't understand that you do have a voice and you can say things without it really being um, aggressive or over, overly aggressive, I'll say. But I, I always tell, tell my mentees now, like, you don't want to be a people pleaser. Make sure you voice your opinion, because I feel like when you don't speak up, you're just giving in to someone else's wants. You're not necessarily letting people know how you actually feel about an issue. And what I've seen is people will, will walk through the workplace, they'll give someone the silent treatment, or they will say, okay, sure. And they, they want to be seen as the nice person at work. And I, I'm always against that. And I think there's several companies out in the world who are also against that way of thinking. In the news recently, there's been top companies such as Honda and Oh gosh, I'm like, I, I can't even think of all the companies, <laughs> but there's been top companies such as Honda who've come out and they've said, no, we want conflict at work. We want people to challenge each other because this is how new ideas are bred. This is how we can keep regenerating the business and turning the wheel. And so they're wanting everyone to, to put their ideas on the table, even if you don't think the group is going to be, be open to receiving them. Now, Absolutely. have you personally seen that in any of the companies that you work for? I've seen where they support productive conflict. Yes. Is that what you're asking? Healthy yeah. conflict. Yes. Let me let me rephrase. Yes. Healthy. Healthy conflict. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yes, I, I have. And, and what's interesting, and this is why I love what I do, because I've seen it from different angles. I've seen it from, if we're just talking about data, decision making, right? And we have to, not about employees, police, whatever, but we're talking about, we have to make a decision with data and people have different thoughts going into it. If, if you're not getting other perspectives in the organization, your, your tunnel vision. And one of the things that I used to see all the time that drove me crazy is a company when they, when they have attrition and then they try to backfill and bring new people and they will bring in people that have the exact same pedigree that they do. They went to the same college. They have the same company that they started with. And in that kind of, I don't want to say corporate incest, but that led to people realizing, wow, we're not innovating. We're just, we're just repeating these cycles. You need these outside in views. And I'm happy to say one of the companies or the company I work for now, we, we do look at it as, as productive and healthy. We do want to innovate it, but it required us training all the leaders on the things like, why is diversity and inclusion important? Why is active listening important? 
Why is it important to have resilience? Why is emotional intelligence important? And I think people understand it is, but when you start putting training programs in place so they can see it, they're like, wow, we have completely innovated and stepped outside of the box the past you know, six to seven months. And it's because of healthy conflict. And, and I think those are the ones when you look at people that come up with the new ideas, people that come up with, they're always the great places to work. It's because they embrace these things. People want to work for those places. They're also getting different perspectives. If you're on a, not the best analogy, but it seems to resonate. If you're on one of those game shows where you get like three lifelines, why would anyone who's trying to answer a question call someone who has the exact same background as them? You see them when they do like phone a friend, they call someone who has a different opinion because collectively that other person and, and me playing the game, our collective intelligence is greater. Why wouldn't you do that in business? Why do you want to just ask people the same thing that you already know? It, it boggles my mind, but yes, there are, there are not every company, but they're starting to see a lot more companies, especially after people learn from COVID, all of the changes that had to be done, that healthy conflict is good. And they just need to put the training and programs in place to, to help people actually facilitate that. You know, that's a good point because my next question to you is going to be for someone who's listening and they want to engage in a healthy conflict in the workplace, what's the first step that you feel they should take? I think one of the biggest things that can in and of itself without having to go, I, I strongly recommend training courses and reading stuff, but I think the big thing for me was I didn't realize it, but I, I, the difference between a, a debate or a discussion and a dialogue is everyone should learn how to dialogue. And, and I'll just take a couple of seconds. I, I didn't even know I was doing it, but when we're in a discussion, we don't even realize it. We're not listening to the other person talking. What we're doing is we're saying, okay, what am I going to say to prove this person wrong? And so we're not actively listening, which means we don't hear anything good they say. And, and two, we're not even educating other people on our thoughts. We're just trying to prove other people wrong. So the outcome of a discussion is an outcome, someone's right or wrong, where when you're dialoguing, you sit down together and you have a shared understanding. The outcome of this process is not an answer. The outcome is everyone in the dialogue learns something new about the other person's process. You're, you're gaining understanding. And it does take a facilitator to, to help organize this and keep people on track. But if you go into meetings saying, we're going to have a dialogue and following those steps and not a discussion, you are going to learn so much more about what you need to do and work in life than if you went in with a discussion. So that's my number one thing is, is dialogue. And, and for those people listening and they haven't done one before, think about if, if, if you're a parent and you have kids and you get a call from school and, and the principal says, you know, your kid did something stupid and blah, blah, blah. Most of us, myself included, for the first, you know, 15 years of when I had kids, I would discuss, I would go in and say, why'd you do that? What's going on in your head? What I wouldn't listen. And they'd say, dad, did it wasn't my dialogue is saying, okay, I, this is what I heard. Let me hear your perspective. Let me understand why it happens. And I think that's the huge light bulb for me is when you understand why conflict can be okay. If we avoid the question and we don't understand why we take it personal, we think we're better than everyone else. And so yeah, in a nutshell, start with dialogue versus discussion. I think just a, a second behind that is learn a little bit more about how to actually listen. And there's lots of studies out there where you can have someone be focused on what someone's saying, and they're not actually comprehending what they're saying. They're not listening. And I, I think part of that is we don't really learn it as a skill. I, my kids spend so much time reading and writing. They don't take listening courses. So doing a dialogue versus discussion, proactively practicing how to actually listen for, for understanding and comprehension are going to help the listeners, in my mind, go a, a long way. I definitely agree. And something you said there is, as far as people being able to, to learn, I, I definitely think you know, when you hear someone else's opinions and you're challenged, 
it's super uncomfortable, especially if you are in a room full of your peers and you have your, your, your executive team. And even if you have the, your lower level team members, people who are looking up to you for that leadership advice and someone's challenging you, it can be really uncomfortable. You can feel as though your credibility is being challenged and someone maybe is saying that you're not as credible as you think you are, but you know, it's an opportunity to learn and grow because I always say there's more than one way to achieve a goal. And sometimes people have tunnel vision and they want to do it their way. But, yeah. and I love what you said about having that open dialogue, the way that you present your, your conflict, as long as you're not in someone's face yelling and aggressive. And I think it, it comes Absolutely. off yeah. so differently just with your tone of voice, because I've, I've definitely been a part of teams where someone, they can, they can really have the best intent, but their tone was off. And I'm like, what is happening here? <laughs> you said it great is they usually, people don't realize this when you step back, both people have the best intentions usually. And that's why it's a productive conflict is it's not someone who's just trying to be mean. It's either because that's what they thought was true. That was their belief. And so to your point, it's an opportunity to learn and grow. Right. And I love it. And I, I love how there's so many companies that are really having these open dialogues and really using it as a catalyst for corporate success. Now, I want to get into some of your last thoughts before we we get into a fun game. I want to play around conflict, <laughs> but any other thoughts that you have or suggestions for those listening, maybe someone who's in HR, maybe someone who's in management on really, other than that training and having their employees having this dialogue, any other advice you can give around this topic? I think a lot of it can be improved at organizations when there's a top-down approach, you, you learn from your leaders that not knowing everything is okay. Like you said, you want to show like you you know things. And I, if I watch someone on the news and they pretend to be a know-it-all, there is no one in the world that knows everything. I mean, it's, it's impossible. I lose trust. Where I like to find people is people that have expertise, but they have the, what I'll call the intellectual humility to say, okay, I don't know this and that's okay. And I'll learn from it. And so I think organizations need to teach that. But historically, you know, going all the way back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, up till now, most of our organizational cultures have been very hierarchical. They've been very top down. Even my kids now, when they go to school, they're like, dad, I can't talk back. The teacher's going to think I'm talking back. It's a negative. I'm like, we used to ask questions all the time. And then you can't do it in school because you think you're trying to, you know, show up the teacher, which you're not. And you don't really ask it when you're new in a company. A lot of that is is not changing the individual who has those feelings. It's changing the organization so that they feel safer to do it. And, and I think that's a key message for HR is adopt the safe space that challenging is okay. Saying you don't know everything is okay. Saying if you actually made a mistake, as long as you learn from it and fix it, it's okay. And I don't think people are vulnerable enough in leadership to do that and say that, but I wish they were. I love that. And that's definitely something that I've taken with me along my leadership journey is really being transparent and letting people know, you know, things are not always, you know, as bright as they seem. <laughs> yes. You make mistakes and you have to own it and you'll be respected more if you do. Absolutely. Kevin, I want to get into a little game. So this is an, it's an exercise I use with my executive students and it's called smooth or withdraw. So we just talked about, you know, how you can have that healthy conflict in the workplace. And, you know, sometimes it may not even be a healthy conflict. You may be dealing with a traditional conflict with, with a coworker or even at home. And sometimes we don't always have the time to resolve it so quickly. Um, emotions could be at an all-time high. You may be on your way to pick up your kid or, or something. So you, you may avoid it at that particular time and you may not even be a person who avoids conflict. So I'm going to ask you a few questions or really state a few statements. And, and after each one, you're going to let me know if those are situations in which you would smooth the conflict, meaning you're going to work to resolve it or where you would withdraw. And there's no wrong answer. Okay. <laughs> 
I know I just sprung this on you, so I want to make sure you're comfortable. No, no, these are perfect. I'm totally comfortable. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm thinking too deep. I'm like, well, I would withdraw, but for a specific reason, maybe. And so, well, and you uh, can just... give you can give your reason to why you chose smooth or withdraw. Okay, perfect. So, okay. so that, that way, listeners perfect. have that context. So that's great. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. So the first one, first statement is, you want to show that you value harmony on the team more than you want to get your own way. I feel like in that case, I would want to smooth out the situation so that if I'm a new leader, I don't give the wrong first impression that I avoid conflict and I just withdraw. So the assumption there is that I'm first time leading and I first impressions are everything. I don't want people to think that I'm a conflict avoider. Hope I didn't come off mute fast enough. So the next one is, mm, I'm, I'm looking, I'm like, which one should I pick? Okay, which one, which one, which one? All right, you will not remain upset about this issue no matter what the outcome is. Oh, that's a tough one because I guess it depends what the outcome is. I would clarify it on my own is if the outcome was something that was adjustable in the short term, like not obviously not a life or death situation, I would withdraw. Okay, and then the next one, you need to gather more facts and hear all sides to the story. I would withdraw in that case because to me, if I don't have, I don't necessarily feel like I, I will ever have all of the facts, but if I don't even have enough to look at a different a, approach, then to me, I, I don't want to jump into it over my head and not know what I don't know and drive it wrong. I would withdraw in that case. Okay. And here's the last one. The issues and complaints being discussed are minor and the stakes are low. I find like if I sound like I'm a withdrawer a lot, but in that case, if <laughs> if they are minor and, and I, I've already established myself as a leader, and let's say that the, the people in the conflict are not necessarily the actual stakeholder, but they're somewhere in the middle, I would withdraw in that case. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> I love it. Thank you for playing along. I think that would really give some context to some different situations to anyone who's listening. And, and I would also urge listeners to send some questions into the show, reach out to myself, reach out to Kevin with any other scenarios you have around conflict. Simple as that. So I have definitely enjoyed the tips that you shared on the show today. And I hope the listeners are able to gather some unique ideas around conflict and healthy conflict, especially in the professional environment. Did you have any last words for listeners today? I know everyone, myself included, are conflict avoiders. If you really have a growth mindset and you really want to evolve and learn and understand why, start having those conversations. And you'll realize they're really not as difficult as we think they are. Thank you for tuning into another inspiring episode of Leading Beyond Limits. If you enjoyed today's conversation and want to hear more from our incredible guests, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review us on your favorite podcast platform. Your feedback means the world to us. And if you have a remarkable leader in mind who you'd like to hear on our show or any questions and comments, feel free to reach out to us. You can find our contact information in the show notes. Remember, leadership knows no bounds. And with the right insights and determination, you too can lead beyond limits. Until next time, keep reaching for the stars and leading with purpose.